This is a story of a neighborhood situated at an equidistance from the major political forces in the world. This is a story of a neighborhood where political and religious tension shed blood on the streets, where fear had a face, a weapon, a signal, where the rules of governance and academic literature have lost all sense. This exhibition portrays several snapshots that I have taken in the neighborhood of Babit Tabene in Tripoli around a year ago. To contextualize it, in recent years, Tripoli has become the poorest city in Lebanon, which was largely due to the marginalizing national urban policies that centered around the capital Beirut and to the political dynamics that exist within Tripoli. As a result, 54% of the residents of Tripoli live below $4 a day for a family of five, as was mentioned by the latest UN Habitat report on Tripoli. Most of these individuals reside within the Tabene district. And, interestingly enough, the richest person in Lebanon, who also happens to be a politician, is from Tripoli. My first picture, which I have named Judging Hillside, depicts the landscape of a hillside with a majority of Alawite community looking over the Sunni neighborhood because Bebet Tabene is divided into two sections, the Alawite community from one side and the Sunni community from the other side. But before going into details, this landscape clearly belongs to a poor neighborhood and as Diana Mitlin mentioned, Poverty is not limited to income. It is also related to the access to basic infrastructure, proper housing, and in this case specifically, political freedom, a space for expression. She also mentioned in 2013 that much of the deprivation, and especially that related to public infrastructure and services, the rule of law and lack of voice, is not primarily the result of households' inadequate incomes, but instead is rooted in inadequacies in local government and governance. Going back to the picture, when tension peaks, the landscape transforms into a series of pictures of politicians belonging to this group, and snipers position themselves at the top of each building, sending a message of threat to the other community, which is why I have termed this hillside the judging hillside. Poverty in this neighborhood has a peculiar aspect. In order to understand its prevalence, one must take a close look into the political dynamics that exist within the Tabene district. While Diana Mitlin has mentioned that inadequate incomes are rooted in the inadequacy in local government and governance, the case of Tabebe Tabene is quite different. This deprivation is deliberate and is instead rooted in powerful political decisions whose interest lies in the poverty of the region. In a nutshell, the district is divided into two opposing neighborhoods that are cut through by Syria Street. On one side reside the Sunni residents, supporters of the Future Movement Party, and on the other side reside the Alawites. In other words, the Alawite part the part, the part on the right on this picture represents Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian regime, Russia, Iran, while the other side embodies the political powers of the West, Turkey, the United States, the UK, and has been recently infiltrated by ISIS itself. This juxtaposition of political power was translated into deadly clashes that started in 2008 and ended in 2014 with the top-down security plan that was imposed within the neighborhood. As for the picture itself, it represents how tensions are translated into space through invisible protagonists and what I like to call the politics of design. Blue is the color of the Sunni party in Tripoli. And as you, as you can see, the whole facade of the Sunni part is painted in blue, which means that post-war reconstruction was still tainted with political tension and threat messages. Also, the street, which is ideally called Syria Street, 
symbolically divides the area in two. It is the green line of the Tibbana district that has witnessed the deadliest clashes in the neighborhood. However, while the space might repel in moments of tension, in moments of political clashes, the street itself assembles people from a social and economic perspective, since after all, merchants have gathered on the street and created souks, and families from each district marry each other. And often, you can witness the wedding happening on the street itself. However, the local government did not implement any development plan or strategic plan in the area in order to alleviate poverty, increase the level of education, or integrate the residents from the two opposing groups into Tripoli itself, which would have without a doubt decreased the political and religious tensions within the neighborhood. Instead, while walking in the streets of Vebetudden, the predominant atmosphere is at the edge of explosion. War is hiding behind fragile doors, as if it would take a political power, a clap of fingers, to unleash its tension through the streets again. Politicians play the card of identity politics, linking politics to religious belonging, also taking advantage of the predominant poverty in the area. Therefore, I have named my exhibition The Rebirth of Identities in Contested Landscapes, the death of individual identity and its reincarnation into a redundant molecule of the overall political atmosphere of the area, a landscape torn apart by competing powers, by the dynamic interplay of politics. So the idea was to demonstrate how the tensions and poverty are translated into space by looking from the overarching landscape into the smallest details on the walls of buildings and the faces of people. Which takes us to my next picture, Modern Deities. During the election season, the residents portray their political support and preference with great abundance. This is a concept that I have linked to the concept of iconography, meaning the religious uh, demonstration and passionate demonstration of religion through icons, the art, artistic translation of passion in church or even in Islam, which is why I have called this picture modern deities, because while these political figures are political, they also represent a religious faction within Lebanon itself. And as Crossgrove and Daniels have said, iconography has been especially important in inter interrogating material landscapes. It synthesizes the past, expresses the present, and signals future directions, which is exactly the case in this picture. However, what is the state of the present? Why are these political figures idealized while they have only fueled hatred and poverty within the area? How can identity politics be so powerful in a space that has become void of identity? Going to my next picture, the encroachment of contradiction. Informality is a result of unofficial commercial exchanges, credit granting, supplementary service provision, and tacit community leadership within the context of Tripoli, as was said by Yuan Habitat in 2016. Urban informality in this context could be viewed from the structuralist approach of informality as the expression of the uneven nature of capitalist development, as As Sayyad stated in 2004. This picture depicts how the residents are encroaching on the electricity line, therefore, the encroachment of public infrastructure. Asif Bayat has coined the term quiet encroachment, pointing to the resisting poor encroaching on public infrastructure as a sign of disobedience, as a sign of provocation directed at the state, the rich, and the powerful. However, in this example of encro encroachment, you can also see the pictures of political figures right next to the encroachment itself, as if contradiction itself is encroaching on the physical space as seen within the picture. So what is the truth? In this context and in the specific picture, the truth is the slogan of one of the major political parties in the area, demanding the conviction of those responsible 
of the political assassination of the Lebanese Prime Minister in 2005. In my story, the truth is quite different. Going back to the encroachment of contradiction, how do these political protagonists in the area manipulate the citizens? Why is it in their best interest that the residents stay in extreme poverty? The answer is the following. The clashes in the bin relieve the stress of political hegemonies without having to go on international wars. The outcome of the clashes determine the position of power of each political bloc. Therefore, these politicians want to make them feel that they are in need. And how do they do that? Through bribery, for instance, through the politics of deprivation. Each poster of a political figure hanged gains the family a hundred dollars. Each bullet fired is fifty dollars. And for those people who are stigmatized and cannot receive jobs because they originate from this neighborhood, this money represents quite a lot. This has resulted in the creation of a resilient, vicious smoker. But how has this affected social life? How has this affected the youth? They have one of two choices. Either join the political and radical gangs of the neighborhood in order to provide a form of income for their families, or stay on the side, becoming erased members of society. Drug abuse is becoming more and more prevalent in this neighborhood, with constant stories of overdose being transmitted on the news, but no actual studies determining the prevalence of drug abuse, because the politicians want this topic to be as quiet as possible. The politics of deprivation, therefore, transform into politics of despair. But how are people overcoming this in times of peace? Has social life lost all meaning? or are people still fighting to survive? In the face of complex political dynamics that have affected the urban landscape and poverty of the area, emerge the souks, the merchants, and as seen on the picture, they nest in unorganized, absurd places that seem to have their own dynamics, their own rules, their own survival mechanism. As Portugali has stated in 2011, in systems that commonly exhibit phenomenon of chaos and fractal structure, abrupt phase transitions from chaos to order and vice versa, emerging new properties, and all these spontaneously, that is to say, by means of self-organization. So could this self-organization be the survival instinct of the identities of the Dabana district? as people from both sides of the street assemble into these lost spaces. Going to my last picture, the lie. This is a picture of a cafe that was situated in Syria Street and opened its doors in 2015. It was done as a place-making effort to reconciliate both sides of the street. However, if you enter the walls of this cafe, you see an idle youth, people who have no idea where to go, who have no jobs, who have no purpose or meaning in life, assemble and lose their time smoking shisha, playing backgammon, watching football, but not doing anything meaningful for their lives or for their own neighborhood. And therefore, these place-making efforts are losing all meaning in the face of the political dynamics that exist within the area. The question here remains, how can you break this vicious cycle? How can you sensitize these people about their own right to their city, their own right to their neighborhood? How do you make a whole generation of youth believe that there is a life outside the boundaries that have been created by the politicians and by their own minds. How do you break the cycle of poverty in the face of identity politics? Thank you.